Welcome to Let's Get Writing. I'm your host, Catherine Russo. This show is about the process of writing books. If you've ever wondered what goes on in a writer's mind, well, here is where you're going to find out about that. And if you've ever thought that you might like to write a book, hopefully we have a lot of ideas and inspiration for you. And today in particular, I have a guest from Gander. Her name is Candace Osmond. Candace, welcome to Let's Get Writing. Thank you for having me. Hey, it's a pleasure. <laughs> Candace, you describe yourself as a, uh, well, you're a best-selling paranormal romance and fantasy mm -hmm. author. So that's a, a huge handle. <laughs> it's, a mouthful. One, yeah, <laughs> it's a mouthful and, a, and an interesting one to, re to remember. But like as I've, I've looked into uh, many aspects of sort of romance writing, there are so many areas of it. Um, that there kind are. of delineate different aspects. Mm -hmm. So why don't you comment a little bit to your area? I'd mind. love to. Mm -hmm. So firstly, romance to me, and I think to a lot of other writers and readers, romance is more of an umbrella. So under that umbrella fall all these different little subgenres that you can play with and, and pull in that romance. But for myself, uh, romance is always very secondary in my books. It's always there, it's always present, um, and I use it as a tool to sort of give my characters reasons for the things that they do and, and sort of drives the plot. But it, again, it's always secondary, um, and it just kind of elevates the fantasy and the paranormal aspects of my writing. You know, Candace, when you say that, it, where it's, it's secondary, and mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of um, preconceptions out there about romance writing. It's one of the, I mean, the largest demographic mm -hmm. of readers in the world is in, is in that section. And there's an organization, the Romance Writers of America, mm -hmm. which was where I first tapped in and got information and realized that this is like just such a it's deep, huge. deep area. Mm -hmm. And so many people, and like you say, romance doesn't have to be the key thing no. uh, at all. No, it can always be added just as an element to, mm -hmm. again, drive the reasons and the actions of your characters. But if you really look closely, you can find romance in anything. There's mm -hmm. romance in Star Wars. Mm -hmm. There's romance in, in horror movies and thrillers and everything. Pretty much yeah. in everything. And, and a lot of the very popular movies that are more the easygoing movies, you know, um, always have an element of romance. Always. Yeah. But like you say, they're in horror and in... They're in almost everything. Almost everything. Because it just adds that conflict and that resolution and the driving forces behind almost everything. Well, yeah. it drives a lot in life. Yeah. Too. <laughs> <laughs> We've all seen that. So Definitely. Candace, you're, you're now in Gander. Tell us a little bit about that. How did you land there and, and how is Gander for your writing? <laughs> <laughs> how is it for paranormal? Paranormal. Normal. Oh. My throat's dry. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't usually happen, but how is Gander for paranormal romance? Um, it's, it's okay. <laughs> Not a whole lot goes on in Gander, um, but that's okay because I'm I'm very much a homebody. Um, I stay in my office and I just surrounded by my books and and everything at my house and just sit and write. It it really doesn't matter if I'm in Gander or if I'm in Cuba or the North Pole. It wouldn't really matter to me. But uh, living in Gander is is great. It's quiet. I have kids mm -hmm. like we talked about before, so it's a really nice town to raise my children. Um, but I lived there uh, a few years ago, too, in my younger years, so I kind of always knew that I'd probably come back to it. And so the stories, uh, as it is with any writer, you do have to spend a lot of time by yourself, mm -hmm. in your office, yeah. in front of your computer with your imagination. Very lonely. <laughs> <laughs> it can be a bit yeah. of an introverted career. It is, it, definitely. It, it is, and uh, it's one of the parts that I struggle with because I'm an extrovert in so many ways, and then trying to make myself sit still and write is a real <laughs> challenge. So that's one of my, my big challenges. But Candace, um, the ideas, where are they coming from? <sighs> that's actually, it's a very common question, but it's very hard to answer, mm -hmm. for me anyway. Uh, but I get motivation and inspiration just through life, like it, specifically with this series, uh, I saw an old ship in a bottle um, I can't even remember where it was. I think it was just a gift shop. Mm -hmm. And I just saw it and I stared at it and I thought, well, wouldn't that be neat if that was an actual ship in there, maybe trapped by a curse or a spell or something? And then I just started dreaming up all the different scenarios, like, well, what if it got broken? And what would happen then? And where did it come from? And who put it there? And 
it always stems from a very small seed and then it grows and then I add my characters and and have them playing into it in different ways so yeah just well, do you like to work from an outline, Candace? How much of your book is written before you start? What kind of a writer are you? Early in my career, I was what they call a pantser. So mm -hmm. it's, okay, I have an idea. I'm going to sit down and just let it play out. I'll write it as it comes to me kind of thing. And I thought that that was the type of writer that I was going to be. But it took me almost five years to write my first book. And then when I figured out how to outline, <laughs> I can now write a book in about a month. Um, so I'm definitely 100% a very heavy outliner, a very heavy plotter. Um, the majority of my writing focuses on the prep work. So I heavy outline, heavy plot notes, lots of research. Um, I find something very helpful is to write character descriptions. Mm -hmm. So I know my characters better than anybody. I know their eye color, I know their background. And it might not necessarily be details that I work into the story, mm -hmm. but they're definitely details that I use when writing the characters. So their mannerisms, their responses, their, their, their beliefs, beliefs, like anything, anything. yeah, anything yeah. like that. Uh -huh. It just ties into how you make them more real. You know, and, and I think that's a, a common thing to do because I know with my book, I was doing the movie script and the editor I worked with on that he was very insistent on having detailed characterization mm -hmm. for me to write that out. And, and the kinds of things he did want to know was, well, okay, well, what's a birthday? What foods do they like? Yeah. And he took me Little through details. that process. So I'm hearing you with that. So mm -hmm. that's, really, that's really a great point for anybody thinking. It makes them more real. It yeah. makes, and then it makes the readers uh, relate to the characters more. It's like, oh, well, I do that too. And I know why, why that character would do that or make that decision kind of thing because you're literally giving birth to people on pages. They become very real, yeah. uh, to the writer at least, yeah. as you're doing it. They, they, do you find that they do surprising things sometimes that are not Absolutely. <laughs> now, I said I was a heavy plotter and a heavy outliner. With that being said, I plotted out this entire series mm -hmm. from beginning to end. By the time I got to the end of book two, I had to rework my plot completely because the characters just kind of take on a mind of their own and they just start writing the story themselves. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm writing and a character says something and then I have another character respond to it. And then that just brings me down a whole different avenue. So book three mm -hmm. was actually completely rewritten from the plot stage because of that. So yeah, yeah <laughs> I, I mean, it's, a, it's a common thing you, you yeah. ask any writer. I think I've found through all the interviews I've done do things change and they Absolutely. do. Absolutely. But I think I've also heard from a lot of writers um, that they do like to work with outlines and I think it comes with experience like we like we said. Yeah. I know when I first sat down to write I well you don't know where to start when you first start you don't know where to start so start mm -hmm. and in fact I'm doing a, a, um, a live Facebook video coming up and it's um, the crappy first draft. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I saw that on, on Facebook this morning. Yeah. But I mean, there's a lot to be said for that because the crappy first draft is A-OK. -okay. It, it, it really is. It's your platform, it's your base, it's yeah. your foundation. So even though you may plan it out, how do you feel about your first draft? <laughs> um, I've been told that my first drafts are very strong. Um, they need very little in the way of rewriting. Um, I come from sort of a background of screenwriting, mm -hmm. uh, so I'm very plot driven. I start and I get to the end as quick as I can. So after my first draft is done, a lot of the next step for me is going back and just elaborating a lot on things and adding a lot of narrative and internal thoughts and that kind of thing. But um, yeah, I'm very pleased with my first draft. Cool. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well, you mentioned as well that you do a book in about a month. Are you I can do a book. You can <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> you can do a book. Yeah. But I'm thinking in, in terms of a month, which is a pretty <coughs> intense month, that would that include research or would that be from the point that you have kind of your outline and mm. then you're going to write? It would be from the time I sit down to start writing. So mm -hmm. chapter one to chapter however many it ends up being. I can usually pace myself to finish the first draft in a month. But the plotting is all before that. Before yeah. that. Well, speaking of chapters, 
Mm -hmm. What's an ideal chapter for you? Do you like? You know, I mean, I've never actually asked that question. No. To any any guest, really, I don't think so. The length of a chapter. Have you? Do you think of that, or is there a certain pace that you look for in the type of genre you're doing? Um, I think it might be different for every writer, but for myself, because I am such a heavy outliner and, and planner, I do have a rough idea of how long my chapters are going to be based on how many key scenes I have planned for that chapter. Mm -hmm. So one chapter might be 2,000 words with one or two key scenes. The next chapter might be 3,500 words with a really big scene or uh, like a pivotal moment, maybe somewhere in the middle of the book. Um, so yeah, I, I like to strive for between two and 3,000 words, a couple really key scenes. In a yeah. chapter. Yeah. Yeah, keep it moving. There always has to be something going on. You yeah. can never mm -hmm. um, lose your reader. If, if a reader turns a page not anticipating what's on the next page, you're going to lose them. So every page needs to have a hook, and every chapter needs to have a hook. Interesting. Keep them reading. Keep them reading. Mm. Yeah, the hook. Yeah, the hook. Well, <laughs> Candice, you mentioned um, screenwriting. Where did that fit into this whole scene? I kind of stumbled into that, mm -hmm. um, and it all ties in with, uh, I started out freelance writing in my spare time. Uh, so early, my younger years, um, I was an interior designer, and that was my day job, and I lived and breathed interior design. Um, but I always wanted to be a writer, and so in my spare time, I started freelance writing a little bit here and there, kind of dabbled with it, and uh, realized just how much I loved it and an opportunity came along to write a screenplay uh, based on a short story that was already written. So it was nice and easy. I'd never done it before, <laughs> but I really wanted to. So I took the job and discovered that I could do it um, with a little bit of research and, and whatnot on how to actually write a screenplay. But it turned out really great and that developed into a seven year, almost seven year long relationship with a client and I wrote many screenplays for them. And uh, yeah, it's just something I kind of have in my pocket that oh, I like to do. And, and yeah. it is a bit different. I mean, screenplays, I if you, I know when I first looked at it, the average movie, they want 90 pages. Like they, they consider a page in a screenplay a, a scene or, you know, something, something along those lines. And now you see some where I look at them and go, oh, 120 or, you know. Mine are usually 120 to 150. 100, yeah. But that's for a feature length. Like that's. But they've been cutting it back. I don't know if it was cost or what, but I was getting, when I was working on mine a few years ago, I was getting 90. 90 was the ideal, which I thought was a lot, sh it was a lot shorter. But mm -hmm. uh, if um, it's really plot driven, yeah. with, you know, leaving out a lot of the fluffy details, you could probably, you might be. Yeah. You might be. But Never it's know. interesting. <laughs> that's, a, that's a topic for a, a, another time yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. But but uh, as you say, coming into learning to write screenplay without knowing any anything about it, mm -hmm. and then taking that experience, and from there, had you written a book after those seven years, or is that when you started? Yes, so that was sort of side by side with, with my writing career. So slowly, I started doing interior design less and freelance writing more during the day until the point came where I could justify leaving behind my college career <laughs> and becoming a full-time freelance writer. So I do that during the day, and then at night I would write my books and play around with, with my characters kind of thing. Uh, and now I'm at the point where it's sort of half and half. I freelance write, and then I write and publish books in the other half of my time. So do you hope to bring it all to strictly books, or do you enjoy that That is balance? the end game. I think eventually. It's always in the back of my mind. I mean, any writer who mm -hmm. has written anything, I think, aspires to, to get to the point in their career or their life where they just sit and they write for the love of writing, and that's their career. Um, but at the same time, I do love freelancing. Um, there are certain projects I get that I just do it because I'm you know, required to, but most of the freelance projects I do are very fun, and I, I love Are they it. more on the creative side? Some, some are. It's mm -hmm. very um, diverse. So I do a lot of work for magazines. Um, so that's a lot of short pieces. Mm -hmm. um, and then I do a lot of ghostwriting for other authors. Oh, yeah. ghostwriting. <laughs> Here, here's a whole other topic, too. Actually, I have known people who have been ghostwriters. Mm -hmm. And how exactly does that work? You, you 
lend your voice to them or do you have to somewhat take on their voice? It really depends on the project and the client. Um, like I have one client who just gives me 100% creative freedom because she's comfortable with my writing style and my ideas and where I, I take the books kind of thing. We've worked together for so long now that she just trusts me. Um, but then every now and then I'll get a client that comes along and they have an outline. This is the characters, this is their eye color, this is what needs to happen on every single page kind of thing. And I just sit down and do that as well. But um, it's, a, it's a great mix, I think, that Interesting. comes along. Yeah. And Candice, these are books that, that you are behind a lot of the creation that go to publication under the name of another author. Yes. Are these well-known authors that are trying... Because mm -hmm. you reach a certain point where there's this demand for material. Sometimes yeah. authors can't keep up. I've heard that ghost writing is one of the things that they do. Sometimes it's partnerships. Mm -hmm. But is it that sort of thing? Or, or what, what provokes them to hire you? Um, I think it's a number of different things. Like you said, the demand. There are certain genres and subgenres where the readers are starving all the time. They'll sit down and they'll read a book a day. So those authors want to keep up with that demand. Um, so they work with ghostwriters or use, use the help of ghostwriters to sort of keep up the supply demand kind of thing. Um, but then at the same time, there's other authors that just enjoy the collaboration, like Dan Brown. He's huge. Mm -hmm. And he, you know, openly uses ghostwriters all the time. But I don't think he really calls them ghostwriters. It's more of a collaborative thing. Both their names are on the book kind of kind of thing. But um, Well, there are yeah. quite a few authors. There are quite a few. You yeah. see that, and sometimes you see contests where you can win a chance to be there, yeah. you yeah. know, to, to do a book right with them, them and so on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it and it's obviously worked well, and it's a good marketing tool to keep mm -hmm. fresh material out there. Yeah, well, you got to think, like, a reader doesn't sit down and just read a book and then that's done. They read book after book after book. Mm -hmm. It's a constant turnover, so it's never an industry that dries up. There's always readers for every book and if, as long as you're writing them and putting them out, they're going to read it. And quite often, like for example, this is a series you have here. Mm -hmm. Once the first one goes out, people go, okay, well they want the, the second one and you want to supply that almost mm -hmm. before they forget, mm -hmm. before something else fills in that space. So how did, did that, how did that work for you here? Were you ready for that or um, was it more organic? Sort of. <laughs> uh, so book one was actually, have you ever heard of NaNoWriMo? Yes. We sit down yeah. and write. Yeah. yeah. Every in November, November. Mm -hmm. um, a writer can sit down and do a challenge where they write an entire book in a month. It is quite a challenge, but that's what this book was last year. Um, so I completed it in November, and I sat back and couldn't believe it. Um, and I, but I told myself I couldn't put it out without knowing I had book two ready. So I wrote book two before I published this one, so I could. And then yeah. you have the, the changes. Yeah, for so book I was always three. sort of one book ahead, right. kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So is that the this series is three, and then that there's actually four. There's uh, four. The fourth one just recently came out, um, so I don't have any copies of it right now. But yes, there, there's four in total. Well, let's talk a little bit about how you publish. What's mm -hmm. the process, and are you in charge of that? Do you go with a publisher? Please tell me. I am a hundred percent in charge of everything that I do and everything I put out. Um, I guess I'm my own boss in that sense. I use tools like um, Amazon KDP, which is uh, mm -hmm. an independent platform where anybody can go and publish a book. I also use other platforms like Kobo, iBooks, um, Barnes & Noble, that kind of thing. So basically any retailer uh, where books are available, that's where mine are and that's where I publish them. So that's sort of the first step and getting ready is making sure you have your platforms and your distribution set up. Um, and from there, you just write the book, get it edited, get a cover designer. Yeah. Okay, so if so, with your books, they're on the shelf at say like chapters. Certain chapter stores they are in. Uh huh. Yeah. And but are they also print on demand? Yes, they are. They are. So you can go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble and order a paperback copy and they'll print it right there and send it to you. Mm. You can also go into any chapter store and request them order it in for you. And it's interesting because that's really changed a lot in the, mm -hmm. in, in the world really for authors because there's this time lapse of being with a traditional publisher mm -hmm. and of course they can only print so many and there's a great competition and great demand. It just makes it easier 
to get your work out there. Would you agree with that statement? I would agree. I mean, if if the opportunity ever came for me to work with a large publisher, I would take it, just because that's an avenue I've never explored, and it gets you really great exposure. Um, but at the same time, I love having control over everything I do, and I've spent enough time now studying the marketing aspect of it, mm -hmm. which is the main driving force behind any publishing venue is as long as you have the marketing down pat and know your demographic and know how to properly promote your books to those readers, then independent is the way to go. Okay, so well, marketing for yours, what kinds of things <laughs> do you do? <laughs> Let's delve into that. A very wide variety of things, but I find that the most beneficial mm -hmm. thing is interacting with my readers. So I've built a small community around myself of loyal readers who are familiar with my work and now they're at the point where if I put out a new book, they're just going to buy it. Same way if Stephen King puts out a new book, his readers are just going to buy it because mm -hmm. they're kind of investing in him. So I think building that community around yourself first is very crucial to the yeah. marketing. And you, and you know, Candace, I think that is one of the reasons in we come to you that if you're going to write something different, you do it under a different name. Generally, that's what authors do because people follow Candace Osmond because they want her paranormal, paranormal fantasy mm -hmm. and romance. And then, if you were to write something different, would you do it under a different handle? I would. Now, if um, if I were to say go very off my genre to say kids books, mm -hmm. I would definitely pick a different name because I not for the secrecy of it, but more for uh, not confusing the readers. So readers for something like this or something like um, my other paranormal series, <coughs> I, I don't think they would necessarily want to read kids' books or be right, interested in that. Exactly. It's a sort of a different, different dra demographic. demographic. Yeah. yeah. How about your covers? How, how did you find your designer or how did that work? I have an amazing cover designer. He does all my book covers, all my merchandise, all my promo material, and he also happens to be my husband. Wow. Yeah. Convenient. <laughs> very convenient. <laughs> <laughs> so he's very, very talented, and I'm very lucky. Um, I have to explain very little to him. I mm -hmm. just tell him what the book is about, and he kind of already knows sort of what I'll want. Um, so yeah, he, he dreamed up these covers before I was even finished writing the series. Really? Yeah. And as soon as I seen them, it sort of motivated me to get to the end. I was like, these are so good, and I can't wait to share them. And well, that's amazingly convenient. Yeah, it's very And convenient. he's a writer as well, is he? He is, yeah. 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 He's Give him a little plot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he writes kids' books under the name Mark Maker, and you can find them um, in libraries across Newfoundland and online. He's currently putting out a new book in the spring, uh, which is inspired by the works of Adam Young. I don't know if you're familiar with the painter. I believe he, he paints the really beautiful. Yeah, the young gallery. Yeah. yeah, the young gallery. A lot of movement yes. in there. Yeah, and the stages and, yeah. and uh, the under underwater creatures kind of thing. So yeah, his next book is inspired by the works of Adam Young, and it's absolutely beautiful. I can't wait for it to come out. Yeah, I bet it is beautiful. So, uh, Candace, uh, I don't want to certainly miss the opportunity for you to tell people how they can find your books and yes. um, your, your social media handles and so, so on. So I'm very, very active on social media. Um, again, that ties back into creating the community around yourself. Um, but Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, uh, you can find me there just under author Candace Osmond. Um, my website is authorcandaceosmond.com, easy enough to remember. Um, what else am I online? Hmm. Oh well, I basically, <laughs> if they go put your name in, basically they're gonna Google come my up name and it'll you're come up. And you're not going to be yeah. hard to find. How is that pricing for your books? Did you? Mm. So I saw one of your promos where you had a book coming out, Get It Now, 99 cents. Mm -hmm. I mean, when I look at that, I go, okay, how many would you have to, you know? So is that a strategy for you to get someone into your books or into a series? and then you adjust pricing mm -hmm. for the future books, or how does that work? It's 100% a marketing tool, mm -hmm. and it's one I always use, especially if I have uh, a new book coming out. So all my books are uh, roughly about $3 for the digital version. Um, but for example, when I release book two, and then three, and then four in the series, I always mark down the first book to 99 cents for about a week, 
and that just brings in these new new readers because it's 99 cents I mean mm -hmm. right who doesn't have 99 cents to take a chance on a, on a new book but the idea behind it is hook them with the first one and then you'll see the profit come through in when they buy through the series kind of thing mm -hmm. yeah. yeah I thought it was pretty interesting and I, I felt for sure that I, I mean you do see it a lot you see people put it put it out there and as far as becoming a best-selling author, how was that path? It was very hard, lots of hard work. <laughs> um, I originally became a, a, a number one Amazon best-selling author um, through an anthology that I did mm, about three years ago, I think now, two or three years ago. It was just a fun little side project that myself and a bunch of authors did, and it was um, a collection of Halloween short stories. Mm -hmm. It just I think the timing of it and just the, the group effort kind of elevated us up the charts. Uh, but when I released this book, The Devil's Heart, uh, it became a number one international bestselling. So it was bestselling in Australia, the UK, and Canada. Well, um, so pretty amazing. Yeah. It's so nice, Candace. Look, I really appreciate you coming in and sitting no down problem. with me. And I'm sure that we've inspired people to perhaps track you down and I hope so. <laughs> ask you more <laughs> questions or read your books. And, uh, and, and certainly, I, I'm sure this has been encouraging. You've shared a lot of really great information. Mm -hmm. And I just want to thank you so much no for doing that and uh, wish you many more days of happy writing. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Thanks so much, Candice. Thanks for having me. All right. got to get that book finished. Oh, yeah. <laughs>